while I'm working. Let me just check. So let me just check. All right. Okay. All right, uh, let's get started. So, um, projects. I, um, you know, I hope you are all kind of done wrapping up your projects. Um, someone did ask me today, would I be willing to extend the deadline to the end of the week? And I did ask other more senior faculty members for their advice, how to go about this. They recommended that I have a discussion with you here in person. Um, there are only two concerns from my side. Um, one is that, and this is what they warned me about, that this can also lead to the sense that there is more time and then just leaving everything to, you know, weekend and then again rushing to the deadline. Uh, another issue is if, you know, you have done anything with your schedules to kind of go after the Thursday deadline, this might, you know, extension might not be favorable to you in some way. So um, yeah, I just wanna hear from you, your thoughts on uh, extending the deadline for the final project report to be Sunday uh, midnight. Yes, <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh what when are your other project deadlines this week on which dates but it's not uh, Wednesday. Wednesday. And the other is on next Monday. Next Monday. Okay, so there is still Monday overlap. Yeah, please. I have, have one on this Wednesday, and then ours is Thursday, right? And then I have one on Friday. Oh. So I do have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I wish. <laughs> I don't want to be a student. Um, yes. All right, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and next Monday, right? Um, yeah, that's a lot. In general, I mean, that's how, you know, just examinations work, of course, you know, you get a lot of deadlines at some point at the same time. Um, but I do feel like at least Sunday would then be helpful because um, at least if you don't have this Wednesday, Thursday situation, right? Um, any concerns? Okay. Um, yeah, so, all right, I think then uh, for me, it's not a huge difference whether you have it on, you know, Thursday or on Sunday. So I am willing to extend it. Um, and maybe then just because it's, of course, something maybe a lot of you won't have. So if some have concerns, they won't speak up. Uh, after the lecture, immediately after the lecture, send me an email or I will be here, you can talk to me. Uh, let me know if that, there is anything else uh, you would be concerned about. Um, if not, then I will uh, send an announcement to everyone saying that we are going to extend it to Sunday uh, midnight. Okay, so in any case, uh, if you did not run your main experiments, the ones that are crucial for your final project yet, do not, I do not recommend trying to do them on CHPC yet, if you haven't used CHPC before, because there is a little bit of learning curve how to use CHPC. So I think between running everything on CPU super slowly for two days and trying to learn uh, CHPC to learn, you know, to run experiments on GPUs, I think you will, you will, you know, it's probably gonna be the same amount of time, but less stress if you are just, okay, it's running. <laughs> One day it's gonna finish running with CHPC. Um, I think if you wanna work on in this area, you should really learn how to do this. Later on in your actual jobs, you won't run experiments on your local machines if you are you know, doing uh, large scale experiments. So it's good to know how to run them and how to use Slurm. That's gonna be something that you are 
probably going to be expected how to know. And as I said, there is a little bit of learning curve, but it's not like once you run it successfully, it's it, you, you realize it's not a massive issue. And yeah, just a reminding that uh, if you are kind of dunnish uh, between running more experiments and writing, I recommend that you start writing, you know, prioritize writing if you have what you need for your main, uh, you know, central hypothesis of your projects, because uh, you want to have a nice polished uh, written report. Any other questions about projects? Yes. Then I was a big requirement for um, an individual Is there a same requirement for the other graduate option? Or... Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't so quite get it. Or... Okay, yeah, not more than eight pages in any of the options, including all the figures, tables, everything must be up to eight pages. Yeah, and as I said, you might feel like you want you don't have space, so you want to put your main results in the appendix. I do not do that. Everything I need to understand what you have done should be in the main eight pages. And then some extra details or maybe some additional things you can put in the appendix. And this is how we usually write papers uh, as well. You know, So if you open any of my latest papers, you will see that the appendix is like 50 pages long and <laughs> the uh, main part is eight pages. Yes. So you said everything must fit within eight pages. Mm -hmm. Does that include the references? Not references and references can be unlimited and they do not, uh, you know, not in these eight pages. Yeah, good point. Yep. So the undergrad option, the option three, is it expected that the same number of writing for two options? Uh, there is no expectation. Uh, even within the single option, you know, you might have more or less. Um, yeah, and depends how many students are working on the project. So, and yeah, if you need like four pages, that's okay. Like the list is actually easier for me to read. So try to be concise, brief to the point. And if by doing that, you have four pages and that covers everything you have done, great. Like expectation is not, you have to have eight pages, just not more than eight pages because then what it happens, and this is why we have eight page limit in our conferences is that it just become you start writing very loosely and you're like, oh, there is a whole story of how I run this experiment. So it forces you to be extra to the point. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so let's move on. Um, this is what uh, is remaining in the class. We are in the second to last week. This rain today, I think, was uh, good for us to kind of... Uh, not be too uh, too uh, happy about the sunny weather and stop doing things. Um, today and tomorrow on Wednesday, we're gonna talk about more advanced topics, just uh, so you know. And today we are gonna talk about multimodal and multilingual uh, large language models. So this is a slide I have shown you a uh, while back in our first lecture, uh, when I said that it has been reported that three and four users are unable to understand more than 60% of all websites, uh, at least without the translation tool. This comes from the fact that the uh, uh, vast majority of the internet is written in English language, although vast majority of households in the world are not communicating in English. Uh, so if you don't speak English, but a lot of, of the internet's content is written in English, you depend on a translation tool to you know, translate the content to you. And this is an issue because this is a nice uh, categorization of languages uh, by Yoshi et al, uh, which categorize it in his groups from zero to five that uh, basically here you have a data set, excuse me, languages that don't have a lot of labeled or unlabeled data. So even pre-training a language model is hard on those languages because you don't have just the corpus of you know texts and uh, doing you know instruction fine tuning or just fine tuning for the task with label data also very hard because you don't have lots of data points unlike very high resource languages where you have both lots of unlabeled texts and lots of label uh, data sets such as uh, English so for example 80 percent of languages are in this zero category that have no corpora for training language models. So can you build a good translation tool then for all 7,000, over 7,000 languages in the world? Uh, probably not, right? And this becomes a massive issues because then the way these language technologies are even uh, further 
uh, dividing, uh, you know, communities in terms of uh, resources they have. So uh, today we are going to talk about how people are building multilingual large language models. Um, and then we are going to do that exercise I, I uh, you know, promoted last time we were here. Uh, we are going to play around a little bit with Chatbot Arena and try to break the uh, some of the models. And then if you find something interesting, uh, you will uh, hopefully feel comfortable. But I, I would love to hear that in like your explanation of why the output is wrong. Since you might be the only person who is speaking that language in the room, you will need to kind of walk us through the example. Okay, and then after that, we are going to switch to multimodal ones. Bless you. All right, I thought you would have a question. I was like, <laughs> all right, so um, multilingual uh, language models. First of all, uh, we, we know that pipeline, right? We do the uh, pre training on unlabeled texts, then we do instruction fine tuning on ton of labeled data, which we kind of form in the uh, as an instruction, summarize this text, for example. And then we potentially have the RLHF phase where we do alignment of the models for safety. So the first part is just what we have learned to call self-supervised learning. And one example of a model that's pre-trained with, uh, you know, in self-supervised fashion with uh, multiple languages is MT5. MT5 is an extension of T5. Remember, we've talked about T5. It's an encoder, encoder decoder transformer uh, trained to, uh, to, you know, with self-supervised uh, objectives. And then it had also a little bit of uh, labeled uh, data. And MT, uh, T5, so not, not MT5, is trained on the Eng English C4 data set, which is just a co common crawl scrape of the, you know, internet. And MC4 is a multilingual version of the C4 dataset. So it has natural text in 101 languages drawn from this public common crawl web scrape. A major factor in pre-training uh, multilingual models is how to sample data from each language. A naive approach could be that we just have this master collection and we just train on it, you know, we shuffle it and we train on it. The issue here is that some languages will have way less examples than the high resource languages. And one thing we didn't talk about when we talked about maybe uh, pre-training is that we do a single epoch when we pre-train language models. So you never see a same example twice. The reason for this is that uh, when you see example more than twice, the, mod the model has the um, you know tendency to memorize that example. And we do not want our models to memorize examples because that hinders their generalization abilities later on and also can propagate issues such as, you know, spelling out private, uh, private identifiable information more often. If you have seen, this is a digression, the example with stable diffusion, which is one type of architecture for doing text to image. So you prompt it and then you get an image out. And then uh, someone has said, okay, it's uh, spitting out the copyrighted material. The, the images it's going to uh, memorize pixel by pixels are those that have been highly, du uh, highly um, duplicated in the training data. So only those are actually, uh, you know, uh, produce verbatim uh, from the input, not every single one of them. So going back to having all that in mind, going back to our multilingual case, low resource languages, we have less uh, examples. So if we do the naive things I told you, um, we would just likely uh, see the same uh, example uh, twice. I, I think I made a mistake here by um, it, uh, the naive approach wouldn't just be have a stream of these things, rather, you would maybe oversample low resource examples to have the same amount of them as the high resource and to, to, to have a balance. Uh, and then of course, if we would say, well, instead of all of this, how about we just uh, take, uh, if the minimal number of example of a certain language is thousand, how, how about taking thousand instances of every single one of the uh, hundred languages? But here the issue is that you decrease your pre-training data significantly. So what people are doing, and I'm not giving you the exact equation here, they are sampling with the probability. And this probability of a sampling is, um, is um, 
based on uh, how many times we have, how many examples of a given language we have. So less uh, examples from that language we have, uh, less frequently uh, we are gonna sample it. Um, another thing you need to do when you're extending your language models to to uh, to uh, larger uh, excuse me to uh, multiple languages is you need to have a larger vocabulary. Uh, so, for example, MP5 is has a vocabulary of the size two hundred fifty thousand. You know, Bird had 30,000 30, and a lot of other pre-trained language models. And for this, you're going to use something called sentence piece uh, tokenizer that we can't really didn't, didn't cover uh, when we talked about tokenizer, but it's also tokenizer work in those uh, subwords uh, as we as um, we have seen with BPE. All right, so two major things when we are pre-training models, we need, of course, multilingual corpora. Um, and uh, we need to take care of how do we sample instances from uh, languages, and we also need to extend our vocabulary. And here note that this is 101 language languages, and that's way smaller than 7,000, right? So how much uh, like how much data, how many languages do we cover is, is really just a tiny fraction. Uh, these are the languages that are included. In bold, I put languages you told me uh, you uh, some of you speak uh, uh, fluently, and you can see that uh, most of them are actually in these 100, 101 languages, except uh, here, let, for example, my language, Croatian. Although Serbian is included, and although we use different, uh, they use Siberian, we use Latin alphabet, the language is almost uh, the same, so I don't know, it's somewhat covered as well, I would say, uh, but these two languages are not uh, covered. And um, Purvit, you said Kashmiri is spoken language, right? Yeah. So yeah, I don't know how people then handle spoken languages at all. Do you have? Do you know anything uh, about that? So it can be written in different uh, scripts, like it can be written in Urdu or Sanskrit, but I don't think it has a standard on the script. Right? Okay. Do, is there any date? Like, would there be naturally occurring data? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these are kinds of issues we we deal with uh, when we deal with building multilingual uh, models. Okay. So I also want to remind you, this was about doing the first stage of pre-training, the self-supervised uh, training, right? Um, second stage, remember, was the instruction fine-tuning. Uh, where we would change the model weights by using the label, ton of label data. Uh, an example of that was plan T5, which took T5, and a data of 1,800 tasks available uh, in uh, NLP. And then they just did the standard supervised fine tuning uh, of the model. And people do this once, and then all of us use this instruction fine tune model to do instruction following for some uh, other task. So this is, of course, then important for multilingual models as well, right? They should also be able to follow instructions. And these are examples, potentially maybe only uh, multilingual language models that are um, in, uh, instruction fine-tuned. So they have the first stage where they are uh, pre-trained with the self-supervised objectives, and then the second massive stage where the instruction fine-tuning is done. And here, um, there is one, uh, one example that's uh, most recent called AYA, uh, which covers way more languages uh, than, uh, than prior instruction fine-tuned models. So uh, here, 101 uh, languages. And uh, they have collected, um, reused and uh, collected new instruction fine-tuning data um, remember, with Flenty Five, we had uh, eighteen hundred tasks and their their uh, you know their data sets. So even if uh, each one of these data sets had only thousand instances, which is not true, there are way more instances there. You would easily have two million instruction fine tuning data. For multilingual models, that's way 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 harder to collect. So. Uh, prior work here, Bloom Z uh, and MT0, these uh, same paper had proposed these two, uh, had 81 million instructions. And here uh, uh, they, they extended this a set of instruction fine tuning data and had 203 
million instructions. But unlike this prior work where almost 40% was in English, so English was still very dominant, here 20, about 22, 21.5% are in, uh, in English. So they increase the data while decreasing the proportion of English data. And importantly here, they included their own data set by doing this so-called participatory research where people together, you know, form a group and they decide, okay, we are going to do together um, certain thing with, you know, that will have benefit to our communities. So you include people who speak certain English uh, languages, not just in evaluation of your um, multilingual language model, but also in creation of data and training uh, the model. And this is then called participatory research. So through the year involving almost 3000 people, they have from 110 countries, they have collected this da uh, AI, uh, data set, which is the late largest native speaker, speaker, so not translated, instruction fine -tune, tune data set. You might wonder what's the problem with translation. The problem with translation is that a lot of data sets written in English are drawn from you know, Western media or whatever that contains a lot of information about Western cult culture, such as Many researchers in NLP are located in the US, so you have mentions of Super Bowl or American pop culture, which might not mean much in other countries, right? So when you are translating those, you're also forcing the model to know about these, uh, all of these information and not about the cultural context of languages that you are building the model for. So translation is uh, giving us some data, but this new AYA data set, which is created by native speakers from scratch, is, is a super, super valuable resource. So yeah, this is there is a lot of development here. I hope you hear also, okay, that there is, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities to contribute to some of these spaces, because this is far from the level of resources and performance we eventually we would have for uh, English language. And don't forget 101, still very different from over 7,000. Uh, just an example of the languages that are included in AYA. Uh, they uh, use the categorization from Yoshi et al that I mentioned before. So zero is the, you know, remember those were the, those data sets which, which had barely had any unlabeled or labeled data. And phi are the highest resource languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Spanish. Um, and it's really, really, really cool to see that they do have this uh, group of languages that are really low uh, resource, such as Kurdish and Kyrgyz. Um, this is, a, again, a very, very different from many other multilingual uh, language models. And, and this is kind of their, you know, visualization of everything they've done. They started from this MT5 uh, model, uh, which has 13 billion parameters. It's pre-trained on 101 languages. And then they did instruction fine tuning uh, using uh, multilingual templates, then their human annotations and other things to get that resource of 200 million instruction fine tuning data. And then eventually they did this extensive evaluation um, also, the, the same problem I mentioned that the uh, instruction fine tuning data is translated holds for the benchmark. So, for example, OpenAI had uh, for GPT 4, they created a um, multilingual version of the standard benchmark called MMLU. And now, this multilingual MMLU is often used to say, oh, this is the performance of multilingual language model. But again, it's just a translated version of something that might not be representative of, you know, cultures and, uh, you know, values and varieties that we see in other contexts. So if you are interested in creating new data sets for your own languages, I think that's a great and valuable line of uh, work. Also, there is this YouTube video. It's about 18 minutes long that I created. Uh, to kind of promote this work. I think it's really nice because you hear actual people who have created the data and they speak about their, you know, in their languages and then they, you know, present the challenges which, uh, you know, they face when their language technology doesn't meet expectations of their languages. So it's a, it's a nice to see both, you know, struggles. Um, I mean, I, I guess it's not nice to say it's nice to see struggles. It's, Good to see uh, 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 what kind of issues people are facing, but also see how this participatory research can come about. Like you don't need to be in a big corporation to do impactful work. 
All right, and now uh, there is this um, um, this um, this um, I don't know how to I wanted to say issue, but issue is not a good word here. Um, this interesting behavior, let's put it like that, where this uh, latest and greatest frontier models that are usually used for English language processing are seemingly incidentally multilingual. Uh, we can't really tell, are they really incidentally multilingual? Because we do not have any information about the data uh, they have created and used for training their models. So it's all speculation. Um, for example, uh, Anthropic, uh, one of these uh, organizations that develops large language models, I mentioned that their Cloud 3 Opus is one of the best proprietary language models right now. They say in their blog post, because they usually these days just you know, share blog posts, not legit papers. They say that all Cloud 3 models show increased capabilities in analysis and forecasting, um, nuanced content creation, code generation, and conversing in non-English languages like Spanish, Japanese, and French. This is all they mention about multilinguality in this blog post. I couldn't find a you know, technical report. So you might conclude, okay, I don't know, it seems like they use kind of high resource languages maybe in their data. If they are highlighting this, uh, somewhat high resourced uh, languages. Uh, you, you might not expect great uh, performance in uh, Kyrgyz, for example. Then GPT-4 outperforms the English language performance of GPT-3.5 and other LLMs, including for low resource languages such as Latvian, Welsh, and Swahili. I don't really know what to make of this. Maybe they trained it, maybe they find this uh, surprising. And then Command R+, which is the best open source model right now, says they, uh, they, they are more concrete. They say that they train to 10 key uh, languages. And then I tried prompting this, all this model in Croatian, and all of them work. So this raises this idea, OK, um, in, Croatian was not part of one, those 101 languages. So uh, I, I, I'm doubtful that any of these corporations have extended their set of languages to be broader than these 101 languages. So is this like something that just incidentally had uh, emerged? Uh, was there some Croatian data in the pre-training stage that then this had come about? We, we it's it's hard to tell. There aren't really concrete, robust scientific experiments. And uh, for example, Google had already uh, faced backlash when they said that Palm, their language model at the time, had um, you know that they they it had. Um, emergent ability to understand the language. And then someone said, well, you know, you actually trained on this language and explained to them in how, in which way, which wasn't obvious to them. Because a lot of these people don't really look into their multilingual data because they cannot read this data, which is an issue in itself. Unfortunately, here I don't re have a reference for this paper, uh, but um, uh, there is a uh, grassroots organization called Masakane in Africa, which does this kind of participatory research. And among their uh, researchers, they publish this report that says, okay, these people who are building these multilingual language models say these are, this text is in this language. And then they actually check whether it's that language, them knowing the language. And they report that with a huge fraction uh, of time, uh, the language that people claim uh, is is in their multilingual uh, corpora is not actual language uh, of the text that's written. So there is a is, there is an issue with uh, reporting of what kind of languages are covered. Okay, so this brings me to this uh, exercise with a chatbot arena that uh, I want you uh, guys to try out. Uh, let me just say, share in Piazza this link. Um, and so and before I do that, this is what we are going to do. Um, let me open the chatbot arena. Okay. Um, how many of you know what chatbot arena is? One, two. Okay. So very little of you. So chatbot arena is uh, one of the ways people evaluate large language models today. Uh, it's developed by researchers uh, in Berkeley. And the way uh, you... Basically, you have here a leaderboard, which says, okay, currently GPT-4 Turbo that was released last week is the, is the best model. And uh, it is the best model based on the, uh, this, um, the score that you might know from chess. Basically, uh, people are, and I'm gonna demo that actually, uh, here in Arena Battle, um, 
Can someone give me a prompt? Any kind of prompt? How would you name a small white dog? How would you name a small white dog? All right, so you, you give it the prompt. Do you guys see this? Is the visibility okay? All right, great. Uh, we do this, we add the prompt. And then um, here we prompt two models, A and B. We don't know what A or B are yet. And then we get uh, two generations. So uh, here, um, naming a small white dog is a personal decision, depends on your preference. Here are some suggestions based on common white dog breeds and names that suit their cute and playful nature. Biscuit, Snowflake, Chloe, Daisy, blah, blah, blah. And here we, the model is more straightforward. Here are a few cute name ideas. We didn't ask cute names, right? Both of them uh, are, are mentioning cute names. For a small white dog, Snowball, Snowball, Casper, Blizzard, Pearl, and so on. Okay, so now what comes is which one is better. Um, I have my own preference, so but I wanna kind of see the room and then we'll click where the majority vote is. Who thinks A is better? <laughs> you change your mind. <laughs> uh, B is better. I think B is better as well. I think Blizzard is really funny name for a dog. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, Ty. And both are bad. Come on, there must be someone who is very serious about dog names and things. Both are bad. All right, so we say B is better. And now we see, after we did this, we see, see which models we voted on. So this is Mistral 7B. Mistral 7B is a, obviously 7B is now small. So it's a small open source, kind of open source model. And then Claude 3 Opus is one of the best proprietary models we have today. So this is basically the state of the art. So they collect these votes. People choose to participate in this. Uh, I don't know why we are all a little bit invested. So we try these things. Um, and then uh, here in the leaderboard, basically what this means is that according to this preference test, GPT-3, uh, excuse me, GPT-4 Turbo from last week, April 9th, is the one that usually uh, people whose, excuse me, uh, preferences, uh, no, what am I saying? Whose outputs people prefer more than uh, from other models uh, this uh, Turbo 4 was uh, paired with. Uh, this is basically what the rank said. However, the because the difference between these is not huge, they all get rank one, more or less. So um, Claude 3 is still kind of comparable to whatever is the latest GPT-4. All right, and uh, you have the other tabs here. You can do side by side, which is not a use for the leaderboard, where you can choose actual models you want to compare. So here we can choose, for example, all of these, and then uh, whatever you want in the other side. And direct chat is a way to directly prompt any of these models. What I want you to do is uh, try to use either the uh, side by side or direct chat, uh, chat. And you know, if you speak a language that's not English, it would be great that you try something in your language and try to break the model. And then whenever you have something interesting, you can. Um, report. If you do not speak other languages than English, then you can do so-called back translation, where you ask, you say, uh, do this in Spanish, uh, do this and answer in Spanish, and then it does something, and then you say, now translate this back to uh, English, and you can see whether the output that you get in English makes sense, or if you want, you can uh, pair up with uh, someone who speaks other language. So maybe everyone who speaks a uh, language that's not English, can you raise your hand? Okay, we have a big representation over there. A few students here. Okay, okay. So if you want, you can also pair up and try to brainstorm prompts together, but then one of the, you will need to uh, actually put them uh, in um, into the chat. Okay, and as soon as you have something, we are gonna do this for maybe 10-ish minutes. And if you have found anything, then please, Raise your hand or you know shout whatever you prefer, and uh, we'll we'll look into your example. Um, what else I want to say? I don't know. 
I guess that's it. I will post the uh, link into Piazza. Yeah, and then if no one says anything, I think we can conclude they are pretty good, which, you know, might be disappointing. I don't know. Not necessarily. We should want that these things work because then that's good for us. Okay. Um, all right, and I will also share um, Zoom link. Oh, I forgot even how. Um, so if you do have something to that you would like to share, it would be great if you join Zoom and then share your screen because I probably don't have keyboard for your language. So it's gonna be hard to write it in my in on my laptop. Uh, and we go, want to keep the recording go, going. So I don't wanna unplug the uh the adapter and give it to you. Uh, other. Well, this one's slightly loony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you going to yeah, yeah. Right. It's more sense to use the one that like the top of the leaderboard because then you can see those the best model that's on the Yeah, so I think it's better to choose models that are uh at the top of the leaderboard because if you bring them it's more exciting because that's the best we can do right now. So uh these two specifically are really good. And then uh, the best open source model is Command R plus. So comparing Command R plus with uh, the best proprietary model is another uh, interesting comparison. Okay. So. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> yeah. 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 There is actually an interesting um, paper jailbreaking. Uh, with... Is this the one? Uh... Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah, this paper has shown that you can um break them in multilingual languages. We'll talk about uh, jailbreaking on on uh, Wednesday, but jailbreaking is um we talked about RLHF and how RLHF should prevent uh models from producing unlawful activities or helping you do them. Uh, such as, uh, you know, uh, building a bomb. And then if you do this like multilingual kind of thing, then uh, it breaks them uh, more easily. Okay. If you are giggling, I know you have something interesting to show, so you should be showing it. <laughs> Mm 
So this one I'm saying, yeah, it's very fun. You can really see the little steps in the person. No, 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 so it's No, let's say it's not that but it answers the expressions results. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. And well, that's using like this is like this part is flat and this part is flat. It's like this are the first of course it's acting like this. Yeah, if you ask Claude to tell you the languages in, is it's trained on, it actually tells it. Which I don't know whether this is true. That's an issue. It's kind of annoying. Like you don't have a paper, but then your model will tell you what a paper should tell. Um, yeah, and this seems pretty extensive if it's true. So no one found anything. Interesting. Well, um, I thought that in my like we were asking it like, oh, how do you make it possible? Well, mm -hmm. and lottery is just saying, well, it's unethical. I'm not gonna answer mm -hmm. that. But um, the other model, what was that? It was I forgot what it was. Okay. I can't do it. But uh, it was basically answering in my language, like have a sentence, and it reduced it reduced the other half. 
Oh. So it's kind of weird, but it's mixing the two languages together. Interesting. Like, not making any sense. <laughs> Yeah, so one explanation for why at least mixes languages is this uh, code switching. Code switching refers to when people write uh, their messages in two languages, which is very often the case on social media in certain countries. Uh, and then when you scrape this data, you end up with, you know, these two languages very often paired together, and then it could result uh, in something like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's actually common, you're right, like, they use code switching, but with English most of the time. Yeah. But rarely, I would see what I might, but... Interesting. Kind of yeah, yeah. Would be nice to know exactly why, yeah. And th th do you then jailbreak it in, um, like, th does it give you information about... No, it just solves... Just something, okay, okay. Yes. Um, I just wanted to space what you said, like, oh my, I, I stained my shirt. Uh -huh. And one of them, one of them was like uncomfortable answering that question because it's harmful or whatever. And the other one said, you know which one? Uh, let me check. What is the. Uh, I'll, um, well, it says model A, yeah. Oh, okay. You need to be a preference. Oh, yeah. So, Cloud so 3 Type 2 is also a model from March this year. Uh, it's the part of this Cloud 3 family. Uh, Opus is the strongest one. Type is a little bit, um, they say, slightly weaker, but faster. So, it should be better than that. Yeah. And then what the other one is? The other one said, I'm in a state of shock. I feel yes. like my shirt is stained with blood, <laughs> which I had not mentioned at all. Yeah. <laughs> which one is that? Uh, I was. Uh, Gemma or Gemma one point. Okay, Gemma is a uh, Google DeepMind's uh, recent model, open source model made for doing uh, research. Um, so it should also be better than just that. Uh, so yeah, what you mentioned in the first example is an example of so-called refusal, and it showcases how alignment is uh, tricky to do. Uh, the model you want models to not, you know, provide harmful or unlawful information, but then uh, they default to refusing to do anything when the information is benign. Uh, so leaderboard actually today uh, is I think extended to in also exclude refusal. So if the um, if uh, the preference was, um, yeah, about uh, just, you know, doing the refusal, then uh, you have a different ranking uh, over over here. So it's a, it's a common issue to the point that Synchronous is in the leader as well. Any other examples? Yes. Yep. Oh. Yeah. What's your proposal is? What happens? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So kind of get double structure of the language, but not how to express the right meaning. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I also noticed like a lot of the times the models just stop the sentence of the mirror. It would um, say something and then stop like without finishing. Interesting. <laughs> there is this hyperparameter called maximum tokens. And I don't know what the creators of this for Chekhov Arena are setting these values to be. Uh, but it also could be the case that the um, model strain to the output the sequence is up to certain length. And now you are prompting it with prompt that require more you know, information to be said mm -hmm. and it's just out of this uh you know how the instruction has been. Uh do you know which model is that in? Uh it's block to the opus. Okay, that and then for that one, that's not the case. Yeah, I don't know why that happened. Uh it seems more like I mean the rule is check it and yeah, that that one can go on and on and on. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I've been giving it like the text in an ASCII art form and mm -hmm. asking it if it understands. And it's so mad at it. 
Oh, I could see why that would be really hard because it's both in when so yeah. you translate to the meaning, but some are better than others. And sometimes it just starts out putting other at the art that's different, or it'll say, here's your answer, and then it gives me ASCII art that's just gibberish. Yeah. So we have seen a few examples where the models seem to be confused with the prompt. And then instead of just saying, I do not understand what are you are asking me, and therefore I will not do anything, it starts to spiral, right? And this is the phase of uh, hallucinations we have been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I asked the model how to choose my grants. That's not right. Only after I don't think how to do this. So please ask me like a <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was another example of that uh, uh, from someone else. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like for that it's easy to jailbreak it. Yeah. And uh, did you try that in English or? Uh, English. Okay, and then for English, do you know, would, would it do it in English? And it would be interesting if it does it in Russian and not in English. Yeah, until we wait, uh, you go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, I read it. I may make it with a good charting, but I read the Asian, like the Chinese poem mm -hmm. of the word of the and the GPT support is seems to return the way the positive model. Oh, yeah. Uh, the other model did write something and it, it did a very good analysis of it, and uh, it's coming in very well. But uh, the lesson is totally wrong. It's like a long writing and long, long title. And so that writer is polite, so you get the wrong error. <laughs> so mm -hmm. The lesson is wrong. Yeah, and this is an example of uh, when we are concerned about these uh, hallucinations, when we can use these references that are made up. This is a serious case because it then tricks people into believing the aha. We as humans would give a reference only when we know the reference, right? But these models would just give a reference because they know it's a good thing to do, but it can be wrong, and then that really tricks people into the main as well. So you just come up with some, some. Yeah, and you, you know, you would think, okay, people will figure that out, but there were cases where people got from their reviewers of their scientific publications. And they prompted, uh, you know, one of these models was missing, and then the model made up the papers. And then they said to the authors, hey, you should sign these papers, and then both of the writers give them made up papers. And I mean, you know, it's it's a real issue then when I'm even the peer review is suffering from this kind of behavior. Did you figure out? Can you move to the same? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay, maybe let's stop here. If you find some other examples, please share them on Piazza. I think this is fun to see. Uh, I think from, you know, we found these funny behaviors, but again, a lot of things you have done, you know, prompted your models with, in, even in your own languages, you got something, right? It's, it's, it's still quite amazing to me that we can do any of uh, this thing. The improvement has just been so massive since, uh, you know, um, even 2020. Okay, so let's move on then to multimodal uh, models. So we are going to first cover CLIP. CLIP is, has been as uh, iconic to vision as BERT was to NLP. Uh, it's a super important model. And actually this first author here, he did all of the <laughs> massively important papers like GPT papers, CLIP and, uh, and newer, uh, newer ones too. So this is how CLIP uh, works. Um, CLIP has two major components, text encoder and image uh, encoder. And uh, image encoder, for example, could be vision transformer. When this paper came out, vision transformer wasn't yet, you know, the model uh, resonance, namely convolutional neural networks were still a thing people have been using in uh, vision. So. Clip, original clip came both in the version where you use convolutional neural network here or transformer. So when people uh, write, I'm using clip VIT, that means they use clip version with the vision transformer, which is what people are mostly using today. So uh, 
you have you have the image and maybe I can just go a few slides ahead. Uh, the way we represent images for for a transformer is yet another case of you know tokenization. You split uh, your you your image into patches. Um, so for example, here we decide on uh, uh, nine patches. And um, then you represent each one of the patches of the image uh, into uh, with a vector by doing the linear projection of a matrix into a vector. And that linear projection is, a, again, just a matrix you need to learn, right? Um, uh, once you have that, then now you have a sequence of vectors. And what do we do? We just place them into transformer. Everything else is exactly the same as uh, we learned when we were talking about transformers, right? You have self-attention layers, fifth over layers, you repeat them, and then eventually you get uh, the uh, the outputs, you, which are contextual representation of each one of the vectors which represents the patch. You aggregate them in some way to get one vector that you can then uh, you know, do the output classification with. And when you, this is an illustration of a sequence of patches for uh, a 32 by 32 image uh, with uh, patches of the size four by four. So you basically turn an image into this sequence of patches that look like this, represent them with vectors and do the attention, self-attention and other stuff. And you know what I kept saying that some of these approaches to using transformers are so not elegant. This is what I mean by it. Like you have an image and then you turn it into something like this, right? To us, it lost the, the semantics of the image is completely lost, right? I mean, if I haven't shown you the image before or if you have forgotten what was in the image, I mean, I haven't shown you before and this is not the same one I've seen before, then like what's in this image, we have no idea. But that's something to also keep in mind, like what how we are representing uh, you know, images, text to us, it doesn't need to be the same representation for the machines. So this is the input to the transformer. And then going back to clip. So you encode your image with your, uh, with your, um, um, excuse me, vision transformer. And you have some piece of text, which could be, for example, caption of this image. Someone has given you captions of all images, and then you encode it with text decoder, which is itself, again, transformer. However, with CLIP, you do so-called contrastive train, pre-training. So you have uh, pairs of images with their captions, and those are, again, positive examples. And you also have, you can pair your image with a totally different caption, and that becomes a negative image caption pair. What they do is they sample n of these image uh, caption pairs, uh, one of which is actually true pair. So for each image, uh, they have these, uh, you know, n, uh, each one of these n images is uh, represented with the vector then uh, coming from the uh, vision transformer. Uh, this is maybe slightly misleading. It's not like you put them into vision transformer together. These n images are placed into transformer separately, and then you from transformer you get um, a representation for each one of them, and for each possible caption you also you know uh, put each caption into text encoder independently and get the representation of that caption. So you have n images and you have n captions. And uh, you can uh, imagine you order the images and captions such as that the, the ones that are, you know, uh, basically here on diagonal are the, are the true pairs. So meaning first image and first caption are true pair. Second image and second caption are true pair. Third image and thir third caption are the true pair and so on. Um, for each one of these uh, representation, you are doing dot product, which simulates the similarity score or important, like how likely these two, um, how likely this image and this caption are a true pair. So uh, this metric here represents the dot product between each image and each caption, but on diagonal, we have the actual true pairs and on a diagonal, we should have very high scores. How do they train? Um, this is by taking the uh, thinking about each row here as um, 
think about it as a, again, distribution over whether these are pairs or it's not. So only from these N pairs over here, between first image and N captions, only one of them is true. So you can think about that this row should have one in the first dimension and then zeros. And if you think about it like that, then you can use cross entropy loss uh, on this row and each one of the rows, right? And you can also do the same with the uh, columns. Here we have the first caption and N images and only first image and first caption are the true pair. So here you should get one and zeros. So you can again think about it as distribution and this should be, uh, you can use cross entropy loss. And this is what they do. And then they average all of these losses to make the final loss. Actual pseudocode is so simple, it's crazy that because this has been so massive uh, and because it's so simple, it allows to be scaled well. And this is why this clip uh, model had been really, really good because as soon as you can scale model to ton of data, as we have seen so far, has been really successful to learn better representation and therefore do the tasks better. So here, as you can see, we have uh, you have image encoder, text encoder. All right, you do some uh, dot product between them, and you know a little bit of normalization, which I didn't mention. But then you have your logits, and and then you have this cross entropy loss, as I mentioned, which you just uh, average, and that's it. Super simple, and that's the point. That if it's so simple, you can scale it up. All right, and then when you want to do finally classification, they pre-train the model in this fashion by using this uh, image captioning data set, which, which is quite large. Uh, you have you are done, the model is trained. Now you have the weights uh, uh, from the image and text decoder that are actual values, not random values. And if you, you want to use this for classification, the way to go about this is that you turn your labels, for example, if the task is to classify this image into these classes, uh, and this is the task of the image net, um, such as plane, car, dog, bird, then you turn each one of these into sentence, a photo of a plane, a photo of a car, a photo of a dog, and so on, and do the exact same thing where you, given this one image you have, you make dot product with the uh, between the representation of that image and every single possible caption you get here some scores and then the highest scoring uh you know value is the one you predict which here is a photo of a dog you can do this in a zero shot way meaning you are not fine tuning the model to do this or uh and this is what they shown and then it was impressive because zero shot performance of image classifier has been really impressive or you can fine tune a model in this fashion as well. Okay, so um, one thing that's, uh, so this is this is more, you know, seemingly relevant for computer vision because in the end you are doing classification of images and although we turned labels into sentences and involved text, this text is very, you know, it's so structured, simple, it's not what we would consider understanding of language at all, right? So it's, although it's text, it's irrelevant for NLP. So you might wonder why is this relevant to me uh, if I am interested in an actual NLP uh, tasks? Um, this this slide is just about uh, open source implementations of CLIP, not important. Um, so if you care about NLP, but you might still care about multimodal NLP. So here uh, are examples from my own work. Uh, this is a, a cartoon from a New Yorker magazine. And uh, uh, we, we developed this benchmark to test uh, models understanding of a specific kind of humor. So we developed three tasks, which is um, given two captions, such as I kill for some cream cheese, or can you please pass the cow? Uh, you need to, the model needs to determine which one is the winning caption here. Um, the other task is to rank, uh, given a set of possible captions to rank them, uh, to simulate how they were ranked by people. And finally, the task, there is a task of given this cartoon, can you provide an explanation for why this is fun? So here now you do have an actual sentence such as, can you please pass the cow, right? That's an actual sentence with a you know, meaning you need to understand to see how that goes along with this uh, image. Um, and for this, 
to develop a model to do this matching task, you can uh, use Clip. And this is how you would use it. I kind of draw over the previous uh, image we had. So basically you have for the uh, matching task where the goal is given two captions, determine which one was the winning caption. Uh, you can, each one of these can be passed to our text encoder. And then you get T1 and T2, which are uh, representations of our first caption and the second caption. And you can use your image encoder to encode the image. So you have uh, I1 here. And again, you can do the dot product and you can train the model to maximize the similarity between the image representation and the representation of the winning caption. So this is just an illustration. I gave you that task to make a point here that this is how you can easily get a strong baseline for your multimodal classification task, not generation task, classification. Clip doesn't do generation for the same reasons that birth doesn't do generations. It was not trained to produce text, so it cannot do that. But if you didn't need to have some sort of classification task, extremely easy yet strong baseline to produce. I just said it. Clip uh, will not do generation for you, but these days models, some models can, can generate text based on images. So here, this is from OpenAI's blog when they introduced GPT-4 vision. What is funny about this image, describe it panel by panel, and then the uh, GPT-4 produces text explaining uh, why this is actually funny. So the issue here obviously being uh, GPT-4, not open source. Uh, like, I don't want to pay for API. What can I do? I still need a baseline for my text generation task based on images. And lucky for you, open source community is working hard. So we have some options. Again, reminder on the instruction fine tuning. Um, it's a it's important part of pre-training even vision and language models to follow these kinds of instructions, such as what is funny about this image, given image as an input. And this is the basically the uh, kind of this um, doing instruction fine tuning was the major thing that's done in this work by uh, authors of Lava. So these authors, uh, they are uh, training, uh, uh, doing the instruction fine tuning to produce uh, vision language models that are able to do text generation. For that, they need, they start with the strong vision and language models. So uh, I don't want to confuse it. Vision, vision, vision models and language, but anyway, never mind. I wanted to say something, but I would confuse it. So for vision encoder, we use CLIP uh, VIT, uh, which means, what does VIT stands for? Vision transformer. Vision transformer, that's right. So CLIP uh, vision transformer, 14 layers. And for language model, for example, they have chosen uh, LAMA2, which is probably what was the best open source language model at the time. Uh, unlike with CLIP, where you can, if I'm training, transformers from scratch, you can design it such that the dimension of the text encoder outputs and vision uh, encoder outputs are the same, so you don't need to do projections. Uh, here, um, the outputs of clip, the size of the vector you get for your image representation, does not necessarily need to be same as the LAMAS2 uh, size of their output representation. So you do need to do some transformation switches by now, when I say projection, it should be the like you know linear matrix, and we are done. So super easy. Um, so they first do that; they do the projection, and then uh, they do also need to kind of combine these things. So um, they use another linear projection. Um, and then the, this is the important part. So they combine these two representations, and now they want to train a model to do text generation. And not only that, but they want to, uh, this model to be able to follow instructions. So what they do to create instruction fine tuning uh, data a serial pattern here, and, and it's an issue. As soon as we move from a single modality English language availability of instruction fine tuning data 
becomes uh you know harder and you know it's a digression but these are still you know images that are pretty uh common on on the internet and think about why robotics is so behind some of these things is because this kind of data doesn't lay around and you can con and cannot create it easily but going back to here uh the goal is to create the instruction fine-tuning data set for a uh, vision and language model so they use captions image captions from available data set and then they prompt the text only gpt4 to generate instruction output pairs so given the description of the image they they asked gpt4 to create a possible instruction and um and what for that instruction and given that caption would ideally needs to be uh the model would need to output and in this way they create 158k uh instructions once they have that what they do they first tune only the projection to kind of learn uh, this one between two modalities to kind of learn, uh, this is how you should combine these two modalities. And when they are done with that, they fine tune both the projection and the language model, because now the goal is to uh, be able to decode, to generate text given these two modalities. This is what they do. Uh, Their then improvements are have been pretty good. And then since then they have also uh, improve their models even further. So they have this LAMA 1.5 and, uh, uh, excuse me, not, not LAMA, but LAVA. Oh, all these names, hard to keep them all in mind. And now, uh, as of most recently, they also have LAVA uh, 1.6, which is better at OCR, uh, automatically recognizing characters in uh, images. So you can see this is also very fast evolving space, like uh, between uh, Lava and Lava 1.1, there I, I, is probably a few months. Uh, you can see in the red over here that according to all standard uh, vision and language benchmarks, this Lava uh, 1.5 is way better than, um, than the previous uh, models. And uh, there is also this, uh, you know, we have seen Chatbot Arena. Uh, I, I don't, it doesn't work uh, in the same way. You can't do the type of exercise we have done. But if you are interested in what are the best vision and language models, this is the place you can also kind of get some insights uh, into that. Uh, and you can see that Lava 2 is there uh, at the top, but of course not surpassing GPT-4 vision, which is not surprising i mean even for text only models we are you know we the open source model the best ones command r plus is still not matching the proprietary uh, models okay so this is where i want to stop are there any questions about vision and language models yes is this like is this like trained from scratch or does the llama stuff already there help it converge faster or something like that? The latter is the case. So they do they do want to make use of the best language models and the best uh, vision models. So they start with clip and uh, llama and then uh, they use this instruction fine tuning uh, stuff. But uh, here on their web page, and this is a really nice thing to try out. They also have a demo. So if you want to put some images and see how this thing works, you can. Um, they say here, uh, OK, training in one day on a single 8 a 100 No, Pretty sweet, right? Like uh, this is kind of data. We do have notes with 8 a 100 You might wait a little bit couple of days to get the whole node because when you need all GPUs on a single node rather than few GPUs on different nodes, uh, it's it's you know it's just I mean uh, for obvious reasons it's harder to get them, but you can and then on CHPC you can train something like that. So if you want to explore maybe for your final project, new final project, <laughs> you can try instead of llama, use command R plus. I mean, how does this, is this now even uh, even better? Um, this is the demo here. You see, you can drop an image and then you can again, um, yeah, get the, get the outputs. For example, here, another funny example, I don't know whether you see it. Uh, here is someone ironing at, you know, back of a car um, and if we ask what's funny about this image, this model will say, yeah, 
something we would expect in this context, especially Liverpool's, of course. Um, yeah, and I I think it's always better to reuse uh, models if you can in an open source world. So even when people do alignment, they don't start, you know, train everything from scratch, rather they just change the first training. Are there questions? All right. Um, all right, let's then finish here. I will send the final announcements uh, about the projects just when I you know, test whether there are any other uh, concerns uh, regarding extending the deadline.